the, I didn't get enough time to interact with a lot of people, but in the cross section of conversations we had, and of people that I do know that I've spoken to in the past from Dubai, that seems to be the picture forming. In the past, it was okay to think like that, but not anymore. The environment has so drastically shifted that it's, it, it, it's, a, it's now a land of opportunity, not just a land of work. Right, so uh, what, what we're saying is we're missing the, uh, uh, the prophetic vision in, you yes. know, in, you know, in, you know, in the West, uh, basically. Yes. Um, yes. to 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 see the opportunities that what God is is, is offering us actually absolutely. that we are not stepping into yes absolutely okay, okay. thank you thank you yeah that's good sorry I didn't I didn't see your hand up when earlier uh who's is it Martin now yes uh greetings again everyone um my first question would be Charles uh, you don't need to answer this, but where have you been all of our lives, brother? Um, this is just this is just really, really mind blowing, really amazing. Um, I two things. First, I want to ask you what the Chinese have done. I know they have pretty much aligned themselves and are pretty, just eating up everything. Well, you, you're in Africa. You know what has happened, what they have done there. What have we missed? And the, the gospel that we have received, can, can that configure us to take on most of what you are saying? Or to, to, and I'm talking on a larger scale, not just the few kingdom groups that is now being mobilized. We're talking, I was seeing a report, I was watching a report, uh, they did on the religions. And of course, we I think we know that it is now reported that the Christian religion is the most, um, is the largest of them all. I don't know what's the percentage of that is really true believers. But have we, have we configured that? Do we have a configuration what we have received from church and with the with all the, the, the so-called gospel has been. Can we take on it really seriously? Our, our, how effective this message will be for people to realize that this is actually an inheritance? Can well, you speak think, a little yeah, on yeah, that, yeah, sir? A, yeah, a number of things. One, let me just say something about the Chinese and the effect and impact that the Chinese has had. One of the things that, that the kingdom has to begin to move away from strongly is we have to move away from either extreme um, where we get our data from. We will either get our data from a capitalist perspective, extreme, which is basically a Western worldview, mm -hmm. or we'll get it totally from a socialist extreme, which is you know where that comes from. And mm -hmm. um, Africa has basically, to talk for Africa, has basically sat between both extremes. And we have different experiences for that. So the first extreme comes from the West. And, and Africa's experience from the West is an experience of, of exploitation in the sense that um, raw is taken away, uh, gold, whatever it is, slaves, whatever it takes mm -hmm. to build whatever economies. And mm -hmm. um, one of the things that the West gave, especially Kenya, like the Commonwealth, gave us education while still taking away the values. <laughs> So that was one model, okay? Mm -hmm. Now the Chinese come in and the West are warning us against the Chinese and that's really amusing <laughs> in all its forms because you're telling us, listen, I'm not through robbing you yet, but be careful, there's a new thief <laughs> on the block. And this guy is really bad, you know? And so the African context is interesting. The Chinese kind of worked something out. They realized two things, they realized if they can build some infrastructure, it, it's going to get help them. I mean, obviously they'll build great roads to the to the to the to our our, our seas so that they have got easy highways to move out materials and stuff. But you know what? We have roads <laughs> where we had none. And so the logic with most African countries is the second thief leaves something to glean. <laughs> And there's some way to take off from that. So either way, the scenario we have is that I've come to stop looking at it 
west west or east east and to say within west there is kingdom people within east there is kingdom people so we need to find them from an ecclesial perspective lock in with them interact with them so we have trojan horses in the systems that get things to work as opposed to wholesalely looking at it as chinese because there's a huge kingdom community within the chinese there's a huge kingdom community within the West. So it's not all wholesale evil, so to speak, just like not everybody in Africa is, a, is begging and not everybody in Africa, you see, this is the whole idea. So if we get that right, and Ecclesia is the only answer to this that can bring us to a space where we, that's why I talk about a kingdom blockchain. When I say kingdom blockchain, it means somebody is going to be sitting in China who is Chinese, but he's Ecclesia. Somebody else is going to be sitting in Africa in the mines, but he's Ecclesia. Somebody else is going to be sitting in Dubai, handling the exchanges and the trades. And somebody is going to give us a, an, an apostolic architecture. People like Abraham John are going to tell us what this thing should look like and what are we building exactly? How does it look in the nations in terms of schools and commerce and family. And this really is the bigger picture I see that will help people sit eventually, even within governments and influence policy. Because this is really to me where the Ecclesia finally the journey is going. So yes, we have to look at those perspectives and ask those questions, but I've come to, as I've interacted, I've met Kingdom Ecclesia people who are in interesting systems, they don't go to church anymore, but they love God. And they're looking for a way to function because the minute they entered the economy of Babylon at the highest level, they began to discover that they, 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 for lack of a better term, their economy had too much weight for a church structure. I'll explain what that means. It may, I've met individuals who said, listen, I came into a church structure, I gave an offering, and suddenly the pastor was calling me every week to sort out something else. Yet I'd come there for insight and wisdom. Now they want to make me a pastor. They want to make me a leader. They want me to take charge of everything simply because he operates in commerce. That, the fact that he operates in commerce does not qualify him to be functioning in that space. You're taking him away from what he does best. So these are some of the conversations we have to have on what does that structure look like and if God releases that economy what are we building with it what kind of communities what kind of infrastructure we have places where we've been challenged in some nations in Africa where they said look we are willing to give you land you guys talk of this ecclesia thing I, if we gave you land and gave you 50 families would you build a system that can be um, emulated elsewhere that could be replicated elsewhere. Now, these are true challenges that can't be answered from a basic church pulpit perspective. That's good. I hope that... Would you not say that uh, in some of our systems, when you speak of the church, and I don't want to just sound like I'm pushing an indictment on the church, but that they thrive on having people remain in these subservient uh, low functioning um categories or 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 or, or lifestyles that because it's more beneficial to them and they aren't really looking to really do anything beyond that i think uh, let's use a perfect example i like using context where i've been and what i've been doing to to draw some of the parallels when covid happened for example in kenya like in most countries in the world um, one of the first places to be locked down was the church. And so I basically preached a message and asked the question, is church an essential service? You know, because if it's an essential service, most we have countries in Africa which ran for almost 18 months without church, close to two years. And pastors were angry, they ranted, they complained, they cursed, nothing changed. The, the, the problem was this. I said we are experiencing a mini rupture. 
in that sense. And, and the, whole, the whole issue was, and this was my argument, if your absence is not felt, your presence may never have been required in the first place. So those are the bigger questions we must ask. Are, are we so important that if a country is in crisis, we are the go-to people or we are the first guys to be put aside? I think those are the questions that will determine our relevance. That's good. That's very good. I think David, did he have his hand up? Yes, he does. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Charles. Um, uh, good evening, good night, good afternoon, good morning to all. Oh, David, yes. Um, my question is, once you have citizens of the kingdom that are in operating in their gifting and they're functioning in these different areas, uh, how much autonomy does each one of them have? Can you just share with, with us a little bit of, in a practical way, you know, the old religious traditional way is that the pastor's in charge of everything. And if you're gonna buy a toothpick, you gotta call him to be able to buy it. And if you're gonna do this, you gotta run it through the board. And if you're gonna do that, you gotta, so in your experience, yeah, uh, walking this down. Talk to us a little bit about the autonomy that either an individual has, or a company, or a, a group that are carrying out some of these uh, called-out activities. All right. Um, <laughs> I like some of the queries you've had because all of us have experienced them. I think it starts with. The understanding, I think, that began with Jesus. When, when Jesus was done, he said, go. He didn't say, gather. I mean, that, that's really the first issue. He, they, they, they didn't start the first church of Jesus in Jerusalem. You know, they, they basically were deployed. And I, and I think for me, what began to happen as we began to transit what we were doing, when God basically said that, the revelation I give you is for people to take and go and function where they should be is not for you to supervise their functioning. And that became a revelation for me. It basically meant that I probably would not see half the impact of what I teach because the people walking in it may never ever meet me. Yet, I'd be comfortable still releasing that truth. Uh, the, the church model was based on us gathering so that we can measure our own impact and see our success. So I, I think the autonomy has to do with the same way that today I don't go back to my physics teacher to let him know what I came up with. But, but there was a season I needed to sit in that class and draw those principles and learn how they work. I'm saying that because I love physics, guys. That's just how I am. So out of that environment, I learned principles that are applicable in my life today. M much like what um, Kelvin said earlier, that he's thankful for the person that opened up the journey of where he is. But that doesn't require reporting back to that environment for approval or for any issue. I think I would prefer people coming back to query the path that did not work. So you know what? You said ABCD, I attempted this, it didn't work. What did we miss? As opposed to gathering. And I think there's too much attempting to have a structure so you can be identified with, as opposed to being the true salt, releasing impact and allowing people to become. And, and it always, David, I believe it boils down to economy. It boils down to economy because um, the underlying conversation that most churches will not discuss, I have had conversations with pastors who totally agree with everything I say, totally. And they say, listen, if I did what you are saying, I would lose my benefits. I would lose my house. I would lose the children's education. So you know what? While I love what you're saying, I can't make the change. And that, that is indicative of the system, that it means we did not create a scenario where people are able to move. Uh, let me use an example. My, 
in a conversation we once had, my now grown up daughter was asked a question. What was it like growing up as my daughter? You know, how was the environment? Was it discipline? Was it tough? What was it? And she gave a very interesting answer that I had never heard her use. She said, my parents had, had a simple model. It was called the leash model. She says, most of my friends were brought up in the cage model. Says, you see, when you're in the cage, you are limited. You only walk in a certain space. So the day you get out of the cage, you're chaotic because you're trying to do everything. My parents used the leash model where they would let it out a little at a time. If you did well, they let out more. If you did bad, they pulled you back a bit. Eventually, they took the leash off. That's our model. And so I think that became like for me a pattern. To me, the thing that should cover people and keep them is that which we speak. If that which we say is transforming their life and they're able to apply it, then they have the freedom to continue listening to it. The day we have nothing to say to them, no matter how good what we have to say is, is the time for them to be released to function in a different dynamic. That's what I believe. So to me, yeah. autonomy, autonomy almost sounds like you need permission for freedom to operate. They, they shouldn't even be the context for autonomy. From the word go, there shouldn't even be a context of keeping anybody. There should be where, you, like the disciples said of Jesus, where do we go? You have the words of life. It was a choice they made. It wasn't a demand Jesus put on them. Oh, one, that... one more area, Charles, just to touch on. Yes. Uh, what, what do you do from a financial uh, arrangement or whatever. Okay, all right. Okay, let me, let me share something of the model that I employ because we cannot negate scriptures, but we cannot also ring fence what's convenient. Scripture does speak of honor and double honor to those who labor, all right? I think the problem we have is that we have tried to create structures on a principle. And when you create structures on a principle, it opens the door to manipulation either way. Meaning the givers can manipulate the speaker or the speaker can manipulate the givers. So it's a, it's a two-way danger zone. So the model that we've applied is basically this. We say, look, impartation comes from grace. That impartation activates you and it causes you to prosper, all right? When you prosper, you place value on those who've caused that to happen in your life. Now, some people can place themselves under the discipline of a tithe. Others can place themselves on generosity. But I believe that there has to be what I call, you must have a kingdom principle of honor. If you don't have a kingdom principle of honor, then in that context, you're also functioning like a parasite. You're basically drawing blood and giving nothing back. That's so it. there has to be that balance of honor. And when we do that, the Bible says those who teach are worthy of double honor. Right. And so therefore, we, those who give, I mean, the, the earth is clear. The world understands consultancy. They do not take value for granted when somebody gives them value. But the church lives in a different context. So when we sit in the place where we must legislate it, then the value is lost. So we, we believe in free will offering. We believe in generosity. We believe in the tithe. But we believe in it all being free will, but placing value. And I know the other thing that I must say here, I don't believe the tithe belongs to an organization. It belongs to an individual who brings value. An organization can't give you value. An organization has no impartation on it. An organization cannot activate anything in your life. But you can give towards activities in an, in an organization to do certain things. But those two, we must never mix honor with offerings. They are two entirely different models in functionality. That's just powerful. that's in a nutshell. I've just shared a, a, a three-hour discussion in five minutes. I, I'm ready for the three hours. <laughs> <laughs> David, did you still have your hand up for something else? Or? No, I, I was just applauding what he was saying. 
Uh, I believe that one of the greatest challenges that we have transitioning from church religious structure to ecclesia is exactly what Charles was just saying. Those of us that equip, those of us that teach, those of us that are called to train, uh, we can't put a, a, a demand as it has been done that you have to tithe to me or you got, that. The, as you know, uh, Tim, there are many networks out there where they even have you sign a contract. Absolutely, oh, yeah. That, that, is, that is total, that's an abomination to God. But Charles just said the key is honor. Right. I, that, that, I've been using that structure of honor uh, and teaching that as I help men and women develop in their, in their calling and their gifting. Uh, I've never had to ask anyone to tithe to me. I've never asked anybody to send me an offering. But I get deposited in my account every day. <laughs> Absolutely. Or every week. But it's Absolutely. out of honor. Right. I don't have to tell them a tear-jerking story to manipulate their emotions. It's honor. But it's more than honor. It's, it's, it's also because they see that you imparted to them what, what really brought purpose and joy and fulfillment to their life. And, 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 and they would joy, they honor you. And this is a major area that, that I even see people today that have the so-called ecclesia and they talk kingdom, but they still want the old religious uh, financial uh, and, and, and drawing, putting the people on guilt trips and all this. And, and so uh, thank you, Charles. Uh, just appreciate what you said. I think this conversation is awesome, what we're talking about today, because this is truly kingdom economy. Amen. Let's go to Lillian, and then we'll go over to uh, Garnett. Okay, let's, let's in that order. Hi. Oh, no, I, had, I didn't have my hand raised. Um, I'm soaking it up today. Um, I'm definitely an, I'm an economist myself, and I'm just just really enjoying all of these, this whole discussion about, you know, church or, or, or our faith, not just being an, an, um, a membership to a club where we go and um, basically waste time and get up and sit down and two-step and <laughs> make a whole lot of noise. Um, and really embarrass ourselves in front of the world because they're like, what are you doing? And okay. they're keeping us up because, you know, we're supposed to be taking our, you know, our morning nap <laughs> and you're banging on your tambourines in our ears. And it, it, it's, it is actually the, um, the opposite of appetizing or inviting. We're actually pushing a lot of people away um, who would be more in, um, interested in real impact. Um, I guess I may as well say that, um, you know, I have come to see the way we do missions even as, you know, in some ways intentionally or unintentionally a bit of a racket <laughs> because you have a lot of, you know, yes, you have the kind of, you know, the churches donating to missions abroad, but then you have Christian, quote unquote, Christian organizations um, that, you know, their stated mission is to shape policy, whether it's in the health sector or whatnot. But their corporate governance structures, um, they themselves are not necessarily looking for, um, you know, Christian talent. But whether they are or not, they're bringing in talent from the world um, to be consultants and, and you know, um, policy analysts and, and, and health professionals and what have you. But then even the corporate governance in those spaces is so poor that they themselves as an organization and as a structure are not being a witness to those people who are not believers or who are not sort of, you know, maybe nominally Christian, but not really practicing, if you will. Um, and so, yes, it's, it's really exciting to, um, 
you know, see that in the kingdom, there is freedom to just, um, you know, just get out there and do what the Lord says that I should do um, as an individual with, you know, whom the Lord, you know, calls me to, to work and to serve without feeling like, you know, I have to, um, I don't want to say surrender, but basically imprison myself in these particular structures that now feel like they have their barcode branded on my back and I can't do anything. I can't use my voice, whether it's my singing voice or my political voice or whatnot, um, without their express permission, because that's huge, especially here in Africa. Um, it's not just about being an affluent person and, and feeling like, I know good and well, if I get, I get this pastor, you know, something one time, I will never hear the end of it because, you know, it will, it, they will just become another weight on my shoulders and another personal responsibility that's not necessarily, um, you know, uh, uh, without necessarily feeling as if I'm getting anything back in terms of um, them adding value to my life. So this has all been really freeing. Thank you so much. I think uh, with everything that Charles is talking about is a real, what we we call things disruptors. And I think this really is, and it's not in the real truest sense of a disruptor because it's what should be in the first place. Uh, it's just that we have to learn how to recalibrate ourselves to align ourselves with what he is talking about. Um, let's go to uh, Garnett and then we'll go from there. Uh Afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you are. All right. I, I really believe that tonight this um this this meeting is is really a place to absorb and my sister said a while ago, soak in the wisdom. Yes. But a, a, a couple of things popping up right throughout the, the conversations, and the conversations have been exceedingly rich so far. It's, it, and I've been thinking about this also, the interplay between maturity and freedom. Um in a sense, one could argue that maturity requires freedom. But in the other sense, one could also argue that freedom requires maturity. And the, the systems we put in place, um, it is clear that if the church structures, we have outgrown those and those are, are, are decayed and they are, they are fossilized. That is clear for all of us to see. But it's also clear that the term ecclesia is, is being used maybe by many who do not yet understand the full, the full scope of the term. Um, the, the term itself, it, it, it harks back to what, what David said when he spoke about God's house being the house of prayer, not just for Israel, but for all nations. You know, from that point, it was to be something that magnetized nations and brought them together and to glorify God in, a, in an exceedingly different way than just a, from a national perspective. And I think for, 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 for the journey of the church, you know, um, there has been that heaven has always wanted that. But, but men, again, um, sometimes with, with good intentions, you know, have, have, limited, have limited the thing to, to a localized denominational and, and that sort of thing. But I, I'm, I'm seeing more and more as we, we, we push gear and push towards the boundaries, um, freedom is becoming a key term in all of this. You know, and um, as, as, as David spoke about it, as, as Charles spoke about it, as, as Lillian spoke about it, you, you could definitely see that the, 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 the system is not letting the people go. And, and, and right. it, it reminds me again, you know, um, to, to what extent can we let the people go to be what God called them to be? Um, I'm, I'm also reminding of, of, of Moses in, 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 11, in Numbers 11, 29, when, when Joshua, Joshua was jealous of Moses when he did the 70 elders were began to prophesy in the camp. He felt uh, he felt to honor Moses. He wanted to, 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 to safeguard his leader, you know, and, um, and, and Moses said something quite, quite astonishing. He said, what you got all these people were prophets. In other words, uh, what I'm seeing in that is that there's a, even among good men, good people, good intentions, good systems, so to speak, quote unquote, there is that, there is a tendency to, 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 to bring in limits and boundaries. And I think at some point in time, um, whatever we're building, um, we have to come to that place of, of, of freedom. That term will have to be a part of our conversation much more and more because as I said earlier, maturity requires freedom. A man does not give freedom to, to immature persons, but at the same time, 
for a man to be for a man to be mature, he has to be given freedom. And that interplay, I think, is, is a discussion that we have to, to have with the Lord and before with, with, with one another, because systems is these are these are some of the the the, the push points, the buttons, I think, that's going to release the thing properly. So I want to show that into the discussion. Amen. Uh, going back to the comments over honor, uh, us developing systems and the way we do things now. Um, again, I like to read, there's a, I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago, and I think Anderson uh, reminded everybody about it a while ago. We want to pray for Anderson, by the way. And this, this book, uh, I don't know if it's backwards with you, and you can see it's called Missionary Methods, uh, St. Paul's Are Ours by Roland Allen. This book was written, I think, in 1910. And there's something in here that I that just uh, it was triggered my memory uh, of how Paul handled finances. Uh, and it says three things. It says 